So hello, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, whatever it is, wherever you are. Welcome to the finale of this second season of the Life on Tour podcast presented by Hilton. I'm Andrew Cotter and it is the season finale. We are once again in the grandest of settings, the Waldorf Astoria on the Palm in Dubai, ahead of the season-ending race to Dubai on the uh, European Tour, the DP World Tour Championship in Dubai, where the sun always shines. Um, <laughs> So it's a bit different. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you might hear a little bit of an echo around the room. You might hear some titters. You might hear some questions coming from the floor because we do have a live audience. I should prove that we have a live audience by asking the live audience to make some noise, I think is the phrase. But if you could just make some sort of noise just to prove that I'm not just some wild fantasist, please. I mean, I am a wild fantasist, but look, we do have people here, or listen. Anyway, so instead of speaking to one guest, we do have a, a conveyor belt of talent lined up to speak to. We've got the man leading the race to Dubai at the moment, Bernd Wiesberger. We've got John Ram, might be able to stop him. John is here uh, this evening. We've got Brendan Lawler, one of Europe's leading disability golfers, to explain a bit about uh, his role in the game and, and the way that part of the game is going. And Robert McIntyre is here as well, hoping to become European Rookie of the Year. Now, we we would usually be hearing from the European Tour's chief executive, uh, Keith Paley as well. He wanted to be here, but matters elsewhere, uh, so he's unable uh, to join us this evening, but he says that he is delighted at the, the great talent we have, the great players we have to talk to this evening, and we want to hear from the players. Uh, we want to hear from the great players of the game, and Keith's golf is dreadful, so uh, we're uh, delighted that he's not here in that respect only. But anyway, I think we're about to get going, so I think it's time that we meet our guests tonight. So, our first guest is one of the very best in the game, and we're delighted to have him here this evening. As I mentioned, gave a little bit of a tease there that he might be able to stop Bernd Wiesberger uh, winning the race to Dubai. He's still in with a shout. He's won a couple of times on tour this season. He's won five times in the European Tour, nine times around the world. He's won this championship before. Please give a warm welcome to John Ram. John took the long walk around there to milk the applause, which was, uh, was plenty and fulsome and deserved. John, welcome. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm very, very well, thank you. More importantly, how do you feel going into um, the finale of the race to Dubai? Because, as I mentioned, you do still have a chance, a bit of an outside chance, but it could still happen. A little bit more than just an outside chance, right? Okay. Yeah, um, be positive. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I feel rested, you know, I've, I've taken some time off and, uh, you know, it feels good to, to do it for the first time in, in quite a while and, uh, you know, feeling maybe a little more energy than, than some of the players I've been traveling around the world for the last month. So I'm uh, looking forward to that and, and just because of that, I like my chances this week. More than an outside chance. You are almost a nailed on favorite. So, but you do love this place. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. you've, you've won here before. You clearly like Dubai. Yeah, I mean it's it's a fun city. Uh, they, they always, you know, European Tour and everybody involved with the tournament. They make they make a great event. They do a, a big effort to just make it the best possible for us, the best experience, and all that with a great golf course uh, that you know really suits my game. You know, it's it's really really good here to hit it long, and then if you have a straight week, you definitely have an advantage. So uh, it suits my eyes, suits my game. It's a, it's a week I always look forward to. It's is unique for me and uh, you know even if I hadn't won before it is something I always look forward to so hopefully I can use that experience from two years ago and, and get it done again this week. Now I'm sure you love listening to this podcast a regular listener to Life on Tour presented by Hilton. John what we do here is that we uh, usually go back a little bit and, and take people through how they started in the game and their journey through golf. Now we're a bit pressed for time but for people who don't know you obviously you're Spanish you're Basque mm -hmm. But very early on in life, you went to America. Tell us a, a little bit about that, mm. your journey. I was, uh, well, I just finished high school. I was still 17 because I turned 18 in November. And uh, uh, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it made, you know, the way I started playing golf and how I got to the U.S., it wasn't very traditional. Uh, but, you know, I somehow got to the U.S., never been to any university before, never been to the States before. My English was not like it sounds right now. So 
uh, let's just say the odds were against me. Uh, even my coach didn't think I was going to make it past a month. So, you know, after, you know, just getting into it and learning how the American college or university life is like, uh, a little bit what the American culture is like and, you know, getting into a routine. Uh, after a couple of months, I got into, you know, uh, a little bit better mind frame, being able to process English a little bit faster and, uh, you know, kind of got comfortable. But the first month and a half was was not the easiest for somebody who doesn't speak the language or somebody who hasn't been in a country like that before, right? So it was... Uh, like my dad said, he literally just dropped me off at the airport and uh, like, good luck. Is that, I mean, that must be very hard though. I mean, you're 17 years old, you don't speak the language. You learned it, I find, from hip hop. You learned English from Eminem and Kendrick Lamar. I'm on top of all of them. Or is that, is that a bit of an urban myth that that's it's, how you learn no, English? No, I, I mean, <laughs> clearly I don't speak like they do. Uh, so no, I did not learn English based on hip hop. What it did help in is uh, without knowing, just memorizing the lyrics, uh, and this for anybody who's trying to learn the language, you know, memorizing songs does help out. It did help me with pronunciation, and just it did help me at the speed that they rap be able to process a little faster. So just by you know doing it and doing it and doing it, I learned, uh, I learned kind of you know how to keep up with conversations a little bit better, which uh, it was the hardest thing, right? Uh, for whoever speaks more than one language, when you start. You know, if you were to ask me a question, I had to translate it to Spanish, understand it, think what I wanted to say in Spanish, translate it to English, and they say it. So that could be anywhere from five to 25 seconds, depending on what the words you're using and if I know what I'm going to say or not. So, uh, you know, to sh shorten that significantly was the, the important thing. And uh, again, hip hop did not, you know, I didn't learn English. I did learn how to speak a little bit better. Okay, good. I'm glad. You're aware, though, you do have quite an American twang to your to your English as well. Uh, it's been seven years at this point. Uh, yeah, and I, I did make you know, it, I'm quite shy. So when I made a mistake and people laugh just because it's an honest mistake, uh, I took it maybe a little more personal than I should have. So and also being a communications major, I really really focused on being able to pronounce properly and uh, just you know sometimes the the shyness or the ridicule you feel just for not saying things properly. Uh, it will make me, you know, really, really focus on it. I, I know where you're coming from. Someone with a Scottish accent, it's hard for us all. <laughs> um, but your golf was outstanding at college. I mean, you know, you, you had multiple wins um, at college, and the Mickelsons were, I think, you know, both Phil and Tim, pretty inspirational figures mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, well, Tim, uh, Tim, Phil's brother was my coach, um, head coach over there. Phil, I mean, Phil, historically, what is that in the university at Arizona State? Uh, you know, best golfer to ever go there. Uh, but we didn't really see him that much, obviously. He's a pretty busy person, so. Uh, but yeah, Tim Tim kind of became my father figure in the US for those years I was there, and it's always, you know. Uh, he's a really good friend of mine. I, when I left school, he came to manage my career, and, and now he's caddying for Phil, and we're still really close friends, so. Uh, he became a little bit more than just a coach. You made the transition to the professional game quite quickly. In fact, you had a very good finish as a, an amateur in Phoenix as well. Mm -hmm. but. To make the transition to the pro game, you didn't find it as difficult as some people find making that 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 move up. Uh, I think I just happened to play good uh, at those at those times when I needed to. Uh, that's when it comes to the most. Uh, I did decide to stay after finish fifth in Phoenix uh, and and you know and finish my my career when a lot of people would have turned pro. And I took that last year in school to really get ready for that transition that everybody you know really want and maybe it's not truly ready when they do it, right? I feel like a lot of people prematurely turn pro and then struggle for a couple of years. I, I wanted to be ready to turn pro and be able to make it. Uh, and then also I played the US Open and then Kelly had to drive me through the night basically to get us to Washington to then get ready and play the Monday Pro-Am and play that, that whole tournament. So. Uh, basically overnight while I was sleeping I became a professional golfer uh, without really thinking about it right so I was so into what I had to do that I didn't have time to think about what I was doing I was just playing golf which is what I've been doing for years and uh, and that's I, I believe why I played so good this is Kelly your partner who is here this, where is Kelly she's, she's so. in the last row over there trying to hide there we are trying to hide in the last row um have you tried she was a, a good javelin thrower have you ever tried to throw a javelin she won't let me because apparently I'll get hurt 
Because, you know, golfers are really fragile. We're not really athletes, right? So. Oh, come on. I think you... No, that's what she says. She uh, makes fun of me. No, okay. We'll have a word, <laughs> we'll have a word with Kevin. No, it's, it's truly... It's, it's a violent motion. You truly could really get hurt by doing uh, what they do. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend trying it. Yeah. Now, you're just 25. Happy birthday for the 10th of November, by the way. Is that Thank right? you. 25. So you're still quite, still quite young, but it seems you've been around for a long time. But how would you assess your career so far? Because we always like to assess people's career, but I want to get it from, from the horse's mouth. How do you think <laughs> your career has gone so far? Uh, well, I mean, as a competitor, we, you know, we always hope we can achieve more, but truthfully speaking, for the last three years, uh, I never thought I was going to be able to accomplish a lot of the things that I've done. You know, I was lucky enough to, to, since I turned pro without a tour card, in less than a year I was in the top 10 in the world. I uh, had already won in the PGA Tour and in the European Tour, which is something I would have never thought, right? Uh, so it's, it's really nice to think about what I've done in three years and, and how many things I've accomplished this year, being able to defend my title in Spain, being the fastest Spanish player to get to five wins on the European Tour, uh, you know, faster than Sevi, who was the fastest at that point. There's so many things that I've accomplished that I never really thought, you know, I was going to do. And, uh, it's, you know, I've definitely done a lot more than I thought I, I would have done by at this point in my life. Of all the great Spanish players, and you mentioned Sevi and Olazabal or Sergio mm-hmm. Garcia more recently, who, who would in particular have inspired you as a youngster? So, uh, being from northern Spain, Oli and Sevi were mainly my inspirations, right? I mean, I was basically in between where both of them grew up and, and lived, so uh, I had, you know, I drew a lot from that. More 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 Oli than, than Sevi. Uh, I don't know why, I, I believe because when my, started, my family started playing golf, Sevi was already done with his career, so I didn't get to watch him, uh, but I did get to watch Ali play quite a bit, so that's what I think uh, made me really focus more on Ali, but then as I grew older and, and started uh, really getting into the history of the game and, and what Sevi really meant, uh, he, he really became my idol and somebody I want to emulate. It's interesting watching you in the Ryder Cup, though, at the Golf National, because even though you spent, as you said, so long in the United mm-hmm. States, that Spanish passion, that Basque passion, whatever it is, mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've never seen anyone so, well, perhaps Sergio, but it's so <laughs> fired up, Poulter, so well, fired up for a Ryder Cup. Yeah, well, I mean, I live there. I'm still Spanish. I was not going to change who I am. Uh, I might act more like an American now because I've been there for so long, but I'm still who I am, right? And uh, the Ryder Cup is very important for all of us, right? So that's 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 why it is what it is. I'm also quite a quite a person who, you know, you can tell what I'm feeling right away as soon as you look at my face. So it's uh, it's, it's something that's not going to change. Just on that, actually, because you know, you watch some people like um, like you, like Tyrrell Hatton, Matt Wallace, whoever it might be, and they get so animated on the course. And some people say, "Oh, they should control that," but then again, that's part of who you are. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you just feel that that is part of your game? Uh, it's just who I am. I mean, it's as simple as that. If not, Kelly can answer that for me. Am I any different of the course? Yeah. So no. There we go. So, uh, it's. You know, I feel like when that happens, a lot of people focus on the negative. But at the same time, you get moments like I had at Torrey Pines, moments like I've had in, at the Irish Open that's twice, the, the two times I've won, moments like the Ryder Cup, those explosions of positive emotion that, you know, make it for such fun memories. You know, all those uh, moments that Sevi had, even Tiger, who's been somebody, you could also show his frustration on the course. You get all these great fist bumps and all these great moments in the history of golf that people remember. So... Uh, you can't ask me to act like Dustin does, for example. I, I mean, I can't. It would be a really hard internal struggle for me to be able to do that. So uh, it, it is true that sometimes it might get the best of me, sometimes, but uh, it's something that slowly I'm trying to accomplish uh, and get a little bit better at. Okay, on the majors, because you've had some great finishes already in the majors, uh, do you feel... I was going to say, do you feel ready to win one? I mean, obviously you are, but is there one that you feel you have got closest to and that was a bit frustrating that you, you couldn't quite get across the line? Oh, on the majors? Yeah. Uh, Augusta. I feel like last year I had a decent chance, and even though I started, I think it was six shots back from Patrick Reed, uh, I had it going on the back nine. I was playing good, and on 15 is when I hit a really good shot. Uh, where I pulled it slightly, but it was going right at the flag stick. And I was like, well, if this goes on the green, 
and I happen to make the putt, I'm going to be tied for the lead. So, you know, I definitely have a chance. Uh, it did not land on the green. It ended up being in the water and and uh, and made a bogey and, and caused me that. And then also this year when I was walking down 17, I think as I was at 10 under, the lead, the lead was at 11. So I was thinking if I finish strong and happen to make birdie in 17 and 18, I'm, you know, I'm definitely going to have a chance, which uh, it wouldn't have won, but I would have been close. Uh, I definitely feel like it, the closest I've been to a win, uh, what I feel the closest it is the Masters. Is there one that you feel suits you best, or one you, you'd prefer to win more than any other? I, I think we would all say that just because you play the course every year, right? All the other three majors change courses, and each course is different, and it takes time to learn it. Uh, when you play the same course every year, you can at some point adopt a strategy that works for you. And if you execute your game plan, you might be able to win. That's why you have so many diverse champions. You know, you have from people from from Baba to Zach Johnson or Mike Weir, which are completely opposite extremes of the game. Right, we're running out of time, but we've got so many topics to cover, so I'm going to rattle through some quick questions, quick answers. Are those your questions? This one's coming. You've got one from Edward Owls. Oh, boy. Uh, Edward Owls, wise Owls. Uh, who would be your ideal playing partner at the Ryder Cup next year? <laughs> well, there we are. Did you, you play with Poulter, did you, last time? I played with Rosie and Poulter. Rosie and Poulter, well, they are. I mean, they're, they're not too bad. Um, so who would you like to play with at the Ryder Cup? Where are you at, Edward? Ed, where is Edward? Where, where are you? Edward is he, is he not in the room? He's hiding. <laughs> well, uh, it's hard to say, honestly. Uh, I would love to play with Rosie again. Me and Rosie get along, play a similar game. But honestly, whoever either carries me to the win or helps me win, one of the two. Okay. Um, and a quick question coming in from me. Who does your partner support in the Ryder Cup, then? Who do you support? I want to ask you. Sydney. Europe. You support Europe? Yeah, of course. Is this true? Yeah. Oh, it's true. Support yeah. Europe. I like this. This is dedication. Oh, she's the one. Right, anyway, so uh, final question I want to ask on the Olympics. Are you looking forward to the Olympics next year? Because yeah. it's, it seems to be a lot of the golfers have really taken to the idea of golf in the Olympics now. It's, it's unique because, I mean, I didn't grow up, you know, with the Olympics being a possibility. Golfers were never going to be Olympic athletes, and now it is. So uh, even though we might not be on the same level as, ma as majors, Right now, a major win is still more important for, I think, most of us. It will be something that in the next two, three, four, five Olympics uh, is going to get a lot of, you know, a lot of significance, a lot of importance. So it's, uh, it's going to become what it's what supposed to become. And it's great that if you make it, I mean, you can call yourself an Olympic athlete, which is a very select group of people in the history. There's still time to make it as a javelin thrower. I think if you really knuckle down on I, the I, I don't, I'm not sure if javelin might be my sport. Um, oh. <laughs> okay. We're well, doing not too badly at the golf. Good luck this week. Ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, John Rahm, our first guest. Thank you. <laughs> ah, right. John Rahm. I love John Rahm. I can still hear me. I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, so, right, our next guest. It was very interesting the way the European Tour, in conjunction with the European Disabled Golf Association, are now starting to integrate and to expand uh, the opportunities and the competitions for disability golf. So we've got some... We've got this week, there's a tournament being run in conjunction with the DP World Tour Race to Dubai Championship. Uh, and they had a tournament in conjunction uh, with the Scottish Open as well. And the man who won that week at the Scottish Open is here with us this evening. Please welcome uh, Brendan Lawler to the stage. <laughs> Brendan, good evening. How are you? I'm fine. How's your knowledge of hip-hop? It's gotten quite better since I joined uh, Modest Golf. All oh, right, there <laughs> yeah. we are. There's a quick plug for Modest Golf. There's a, I, I, well, let's start with that, actually, because you're straight into Niall Horan's stable, who, you know, he manages, or they manage a lot of good players, Guido Miliozzi among them. They've been having a good year. So you got very quickly involved with them. How did that come about? Yeah, so um, I got in touch with Mark uh, after I won in Scotland. Uh, we had a few meetings here and there, just talking about what's your ambitions or what are you going to do next. So, obviously, as you can see, uh, Modest do a lot of great things for inclusion in sport, Event, yeah, equal pay for men and women in, in events, and obviously the sign of me to their stable has been a massive step in disability golf. It just shows people that um, in, any aspects, in any aspects of life, they're um, capable of playing the game on the same level as some of the top guys out here. And it felt really good that the boys could uh, accept that and, and sign me onto their stable, so it's, it's fantastic. Just tell us a bit about your background, because you have, 
It's Ellis Van Crevel syndrome. So can you explain a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so Ellis Van Crevel syndrome is uh, shorter limbs and shorter stature. Um, it, it never really affected me throughout my whole life. I went to school, I made friends, I, I done everything a, a normal person would do. And I joined golf at 16, <coughs> played able body golf up to two years ago. And uh, I'm just enjoying the journey and turned to disability golf in November 2017 and the doors that has opened for me now has been amazing. How much has it changed in the last few years though? Because you said you started at 16. Yeah. Uh, was it easy for you to uh, get into golf? You're from Dundalk? Yeah, Dundalk. Yeah. So where, is that where you started? <coughs> I started in RD, which is uh, about 10 minutes away from my house. And uh, I joined Dundalk in 2018. There was, um, RD was a great golf club for me, but there was a lot of competition in Dundalk and this, they asked me, did I want to join? And join their panels, senior panels, and I said, I think it would be a great move for me and might build my game with playing, playing against people that are off plus two, plus three handicaps and, and bring me on and try and get me to their level as well, which, which was a great move for me. And then um, went down the road of disability golf and I'm still playing in Dundalk. It's, it's a great club and they let me use the facilities and they're, they're really, really good to me. So what is your handicap at the moment when you're... I, I turn off. professional off scratch. Right, yeah. okay. So when you turn pro, and this year at the Scottish Open, when you're playing, so you play on the Friday and Saturday? Yeah. You play the same course, same tees? Same course, same tees, yeah. And did you shoot, you shot? Shot level par 71 the final day. Right. Yeah, every, everything went right. Um, played, I played really, really well. I got off to a, f a quick start and was three under after eight holes, bogey nine, and then was two over for the last, last nine, which was... It was, it was like a step forward in the game and, and it made people realise that we can, when we're out here playing, we can shoot scores and, and not compete at the highest level, but definitely compete. Well, 71 off the championship tees with the Scottish Open setup is... Yeah, it's not it's bad. Pretty, it's not bad. <laughs> but, so when you're competing as well, because obviously in other para sports, you would have various categories within those sports. Yeah. So is there a similar setup in golf? Um, so disability golf falls under many different categories. You could have cerebral palsy, um, amputee golf, uh, shoulder and stature like myself. So there's different aspects of disability golf, but there's a separate organisation for like blind golf and all that sort of stuff. So there is separate organisations, but in um, European Disabled Golf Association, they allow wheelchair players in as well. So to do like a staple for a category, a net category, and a gross category for the wheelchair players. Right. So we have a tournament, ne is it next week? No, two weeks time. You're going to Australia straight yeah. after this one as well. And that's another tournament which is run in conjunction with the, the uh, able-bodied event. Yeah. So uh, how many tournaments is that now a, a year that you're able to compete in the same stage? It's going to be roughly next year around four. Keith Pelly is doing fantastic, uh, fantastic things in the game for us, making the golf in inclusive. And um, the competitions that he's, uh, that he's getting us into, speaking on behalf of the eight other disability golfers here this week, it's, it's truly a dream come true. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I've got a question from Joseph. He's out there somewhere, Joseph. Uh, just a simple question. What's so special about the game of golf for you? Did you take to it very quickly? I mean, obviously you became good quite quickly, but um, you have to enjoy it as well. Yeah, I, um, I, as I said, I'm only playing golf for about six or seven years. I played a game called Pitch and Putt which is quite big in Ireland. The likes of Shane Larry and Porter Carrington would have done that when they were young. Um, it's a game from about 60, 70 yards, which really hones in your short game, which uh, it definitely stood to me when I was starting off because I was missing greens and stuff, and I had to rely a lot on my short game. So, um, what was the question? I can, do you know what? I, I, I've kind of lost my thread myself. No, it's just what's special about the game of golf for you. What do, what do you particularly like about it? What's special about the <coughs> golf is it's a game for everyone. If you're off a 27 handicap or if you're off scratch, you're on an equal playing field, which is quite amazing. Yeah. That's what I love about it. Let's see if you can shoot 71 round renaissance off the championship tees during a tournament. Do you have aspirations to try as well as you're a professional to try, I don't know, and try and qualify for other tournaments out with the disability programme? Yeah, like at the, at the minute I'm flying the flag for disability golf and, and the likes of ISPS Handa are doing fantastic stuff for the game. And they actually asked me to be a brand ambassador for their tournament in Ireland this year. 
So with ISPS Hand that are accepting the game as well, it's quite fantastic and we're going to get into more events, so it's really good. And the importance of what the European Tour is doing, I suppose, in terms of other governing bodies might recognise that golf is a sport that could be competed for. For <coughs> example, we talked about John Ram about the Olympics, but at the yeah. Paralympics, golf being involved. Yeah, like um, the reason this is all happening, our, our main goal and the focus is the Paralympics. Now, I missed out on the last one. I reckon if all this was happening three months previous to when the decision was made for the Paralympics, we would have been in. Because the moves that are made now are, are um, they're really going in the right direction. And it, it was just a wee bit too late, but I definitely think we'll be in the next Paralympics. Yeah. And um, have you uh, met and enjoyed the company of Niall Horan, who is the big boss of Modest Golf? And if so, what do you, what do you think about him? Yeah, Niall's uh, he's a top lad. Like, he loves his golf, doesn't he? He loves it, and he's a good golfer as well. I had the pleasure to play with him in Galgorm. And for a man that's so busy and so talented and, and is always flying here and there with his music, he's so invested in the business, which is incredible. And, and that's, that's really incredible. You mentioned Shane Lowry. Uh, who would be your golfing, I'd say you came to it quite late, but who would be your golfing inspirations when you were taken to the game? Um, I really like Paul Harrington. I met <coughs> when Irish Open was in Baltray in 2009. I got the pleasure to meet Paul Harrington, which was, uh, which was class. And uh, I always watch swing videos and just see how he did it. I, I don't think he's the best person to watch swing videos because he, he's always doing different things here and there. But um, no, because he's Irish as well, I think he's one, one of my biggest. Yeah. Yeah, like. What do you think about the plans, which we hear that there's plans to have a full European disability tour by 2021, is it? Yeah, so um, Keith Pelly wants to disable golf tour to run, run alongside the European tour. Which I think is possible. The, um, we just need a wee bit more demand for players. I think there's 18 professional disability golfers at the minute on the EGA tour. And that's not the ones that are a really high standard that may be off scratch, plus one, one handicap. So if we get the demand, I think that's quite possible to achieve. Well, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. Brendan Lawler, ladies and gentlemen. Brendan, thank you. And good luck this week as well. All the best, Brendan. Cheers. Thank you. Good luck in Australia as well. So our next player to the stage, I hope I've got the order right. Um, I can't see him hanging around, but hopefully he'll be brought up to the stage. Anyway, our next player to the stage, I'm delighted to say, from a parochial point of view, is Scottish. Uh, <laughs> you're looking nervous. Yes, I have got the right one, I think. Anyway, he is uh, leading the charge at the moment to become European Tour Rookie of the Year. He's in pole position, but he's being chased down hard as well. Will you please welcome to the stage from Scotland, Robert McIntyre. Standing up and giving a sort of bow as Scotland's number one. Welcome, Thank you, welcome, Robert. Actually, I must start on that because uh, people seem to have very quickly taken to calling you Bob, Bobby. Which do you prefer? Bob. Bob? Uh, for sure. Does, it, does your mother call you Robert, though? That's my given name, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See, there, there have been some good Roberts, though. I mean, Robert, well, no, I think Bobby's probably have it in golf. You've got Bobby Locke, Bobby Jones. Who are the Roberts? Rock, Gamez, Allenby. We'll go with Bob then, eh? Yeah, we'll go Bob, exactly. We'll go Bob. Here we go. If you prefer Bob, then Bob it is. Um, so how are you doing? You're obviously in great shape, playing well and playing well recently. So feeling confident about the week? Yeah, I've just got to stick to my, my guns. Um, I've been playing good all year, so it's not really another a big change coming here. Uh, golf course, I feel, suits my game. Yeah. So hopefully we can have a good one. Do you enjoy all this as well? Because this is when you start, the trouble is when you, when you start to get, you know, reach a certain level in the game as well, you're asked to do all sorts of things like this. Is this part of the scene that you would enjoy? Uh, I wouldn't say it's something that I'm used to. A, a small Oban boy, west coast of Scotland, isn't used to, to the glamorous scene of Dubai, really. So it's something that I've got to get used to if I want to go to where I want to go in, in golf. So... Yeah, we'll just soak it all in. Have we got anybody from Oban in this evening at all? Does anybody know who is not from Oban know where Oban is? I know where Oban is. Bob, well, obviously you do. Anyway, nobody from Oban. Do, can you explain where Oban is on the map? <laughs> he doesn't even know where Oban is. That's how <laughs> small 
Oban is halfway up the west coast of Scotland, but it's the main port, it's the main gateway to the Isles, though, yeah. isn't it? It's a beautiful place. You should go, honestly. I'm talking to the audience, not to Bob here. Bob's been to Oban. But the reason I bring up Oban is because you come from a golf course, Glen Cruton in Oban, which is, what, 4,400 yards, side of a hill? Yep. Par 62. So, again, tell us about your sort of start in golf and how quickly you became good at it. So, I've been brought up, obviously, in Oban. Um, I lived on the golf course, luckily enough. Uh, I played lots of other sports, football, shinty. Shouldn't he been a Scottish sport? I really can't be bothered to explain shouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it's just um, some violent hockey, is that right? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So I've been brought into golf when I, as soon as I could, I could really walk. I got given a golf club. Um, my dad played. My sisters got brought into the game. So it's just been passed through the the generations in the family, um, and yeah. So here we are now. Yeah, well, there we are. It's a good course, James Braid design course, beautiful location, but, uh, I mean, you actually went the U.S. college route as well, didn't you? You went to, was it Louisiana you were yep. in? Yeah, for actually, a year you and a half. You didn't, did you play against? John would have been at college at the same I, time. Yeah, exact same time. I played with him in a few, in a few events, so... Um, was that a bit of an eye-opener, going over there then, as you say, from a smallish place in the west coast of Scotland? How did you enjoy it? I had to grow up very fast. It was... It was a learning experience. It was a place that I had to go, um, living at home. Mum and dad, just mum made me dinner, done my washing, done everything at home, still does. But I had to move away there and learn how to, to survive, really. So, um, no, it was a great learning experience and it's something that I would, I would advise anyone coming through the amateur ranks to go and do. Must have stood you in good stead. When you look at this rookie season you've had, I mean, three second places, great performance at the Open Championship. Again, uh, as we talked to John, how did you find that transition to being a professional? I mean, it seems to have come quite easily to you. I don't really, I don't really try and see it as a, a different level. I just try and, if I can get better at golf as a game, then, I feel like there's only such a certain level that people can get to as a, as a game. And I just feel like I've just got to go and play, play that game and just try and improve step by step, piece by piece. And if you can do that, you just keep moving up the rankings. And that's, what I'm, that's my aim in life, is just try and take little baby steps up. Um, and if you do that, you're going you're gonna to keep improving. I mentioned runner-up in a couple of tournaments, the British Masters among them, but then that performance in the Open Championship stands out. Would that be even uh, prouder for you than the, the runner-up places, how you played at Portrush? I'd say so. I mean, turning up at the Open, first major, I didn't... There was no expectation other than what I put on myself. So I just had to turn up there and I gave it everything. It was actually a week that I didn't putt that great. Um, Hit it probably the best I've hit it all year that week. So to walk off sixth place was, it opened my eyes to the world of golf, really. It said to me that I can compete rather than just be making up the numbers. So it let me realise that, right, I can play out here in the main tour. Yeah. One thing that happened, I, I, I don't know if you don't like it being brought up, I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> but it was something that you earned quite a lot of praise for, was when you're playing with Kyle Stanley. And you said you did it in the right way because... We see a lot of players, pros, don't shout four. And Kyle didn't shout four, or his ball went into the crowd. But you had a word with him about it. Now, did you think at that time that's just the right thing to do? We should all, as professionals, be shouting four if a ball's going near the crowd? Yeah, that's just it's the etiquette of sport, if, of golf. If ball's heading into the crowd, I shout four. It's just a done thing. And I felt like I'd done it, done it in the right manner after the round. Um, so, yeah, it got, it got dealt with the way I felt like it should have, and it has taken a lot of notice. There's been some bad press, there's been some good press, but most people are behind me, so it's, it's been dealt with the way that I thought it should have. How did, how did Kyle take it? He just took it. <laughs> He's not going to argue with someone from Open, <laughs> shinty player. Anyway, listen, uh, European Tour Rookie of the Year, it, I mean, it's a great honour. Look at some of the names they've won at Olathabel. Brooks Kepka, um, uh, Keimer, Monte, Garcia, Bjorn, John Ram, what happened to him? Um, but the Rookies of the Year, 
not invariably go on to have great success in the game beyond that, but it shows that you're doing the right things and on the right path. Yeah, it's something that obviously once I got in the position that I could win it, that it became one of my goals by the end of the year. And it's something that a lot of people look at as a stepping stone. And for me, it would be a great honour to, to win that. And But I've still got a lot of golf to play. I've got four four big rounds to play and who knows, hopefully I can get the bigger prize at the end of the week. Can I just quickly go back to your first round as a professional? Was it on the MENA tour? It was out here in the Middle yep. East, wasn't it? it was what are you shooting your first round as a pro? Oh, I think it was, was it five over par, six over par? I don't know what the par was, but it was a 79 bob, Robert. Right. Um, 79. <laughs> but then from there, you went on to just miss the playoff by a shot. So it's kind of a lesson that... You know, you, you don't give up after one round, but it's a, an interesting start to a pro career. That's funny enough. I've, I messaged my manager as soon as I finished to say, oh, well, it can only get better from here. So um, I try not to worry about it. Even last week, I'm sitting almost dead last in the field after two rounds. And I'm moaning and groaning, and I'm thinking, what am I doing here in South Africa? There's black mambas, there's everything running about. But we just dug in deep and... We actually stood in the 14th tee with still a chance to, to win the tournament on the Sunday. So anything can happen in golf and it turns so fast. But you always seem to keep quite grounded as well. And I was reading that your parents are also foster parents as well. And you've seen that there are some people who don't have great starts in life. So at the end of the day, it's a cliche, but it's only, it's only a game. Yeah, that's, that's been a big um, learning curve for me and is having the, the the kids that we've seen coming through the door, uh, they've, they're the lucky ones that have have had the chance to to get better at anything in life, just have a life. There's still some kids out there that aren't getting help. And I mean, for me, I spoke to spoke to the boys this morning on FaceTime. They're still at home. My mum and dad are here, but my sisters are looking after them. And it's just like I'm out here playing golf, and sometimes I can get. I can get homesick, I can get down on myself, not playing good golf, but the minute you speak to them, it's golf's out the window, it's, it's life, you, you go and speak to the boys, you, yeah, you just have a, a bit of fun, and they've, they've made me grow up so fast. I'm going to get a bit jingoistic again, I know we don't have anybody from Oban in the audience, do we have anybody from Scotland at all in the audience? Come on, oh, there we are in the back. You seemed a bit, shy, a bit ashamed about that for some reason. Come on, be proud. We're, we're doing okay. That's Scotland's motto, we're doing okay. Um, but do you have some pride in now being Scotland's number one golfer? It's pretty cool. Um, for being 23 year old, I didn't think at the start of the year that I'd be in this position, if I'm being honest. I thought just keep my card, stay steady where I am. But Things move fast and you've got to keep moving with it. Um, but to be Scotland's best golfer just now, um, at least I'm, I'm going to be able to say, if anyone annoys me at my golf club, oh, you're not better than me. So Exactly. And there I is a few of them at home. <laughs> I can imagine. Right, question from the audience. We've got one from Dan Parr. Is Dan Parr here? Dan Parr. Have we just made that name up, Dan, Dan Birdie. Dan Parr, uh, but a question for Robert. He is here somewhere. Uh, who was your childhood hero growing up in golf and non-golf? The world of non-golf. Uh, so who was your golfing hero and any other inspiration to you growing up? Well, golfer's got to be Phil Mickelson. Fellow lefty, so you can't really look far from him and he just made you play. He's not really left-handed though. He's not even a genuine left-hander. Neither am I. Are you not? You're right-handed. <laughs> I'm looking at him, holding his microphone in his right hand, and not quite getting it. Yeah. So you. So okay. Right. Okay. We've got to take a little diversion then. Why did you take up golf left-handed if you are right-handed? My dad. He's the exact same, and I just must have picked up one of his golf clubs when I was a young boy, and or seen him playing, and thought that must be the way to do it. I couldn't honestly tell you exactly how. Is that a bit, a bit because Shinty is? Kind of forehand and backhand. You just hit it with both sides of the yeah. stick. Yeah. So there's a lot of golfers back home that are are cack handed. So they'll play they'll play right handed but grip it left handed, mm. and vice versa. So it's um, yeah, it's something that I've just been I've been given and mm. brought up with. 
You are listening to the Shinty Podcast, presented by Hilton. Thank you <laughs> for coming along. Um, right, so Phil Mickelson was your golfing hero, uh, non-golfing hero, or just someone you looked up to, wanted to be? Sounds soppy, but it's probably my dad. No, it's not soppy at all. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Is he here this evening? Yes, yeah, somewhere. Where is he? He'll is be this Doug, is it Dougie? He'll be hiding at the back somewhere. Where is Dougie, Where is Dougie McIntyre? Ah, he's, he's away with my mum somewhere. All right, hiding. Okay. Very good, excellent. Right, okay, so um, beyond this year then, looking forward, you know, talking to John about uh, Ryder Cup, I, I mean, I presume that has to be a, a big goal. And Scotland haven't had that many players in the Ryder Cup since Monty not departed the scene. He's still going, bless him, but uh, since his last appearance. Yeah, it's something that I've, I'll set a goal for next year is obviously to get into that. But just now my main goal is trying to get in the top 50 in the world. If you can do that, then that really opens the door for the the Ryder Cup by playing in all the majors next year, which gives you enough points to then push on to the, the Ryder Cup. But just now, I set on this week and yeah, see what happens. Some, going somewhere like the Masters, is that just a major aspiration for you? It's a dream. Um, I've said it all along. If there's one event that I want to play once in my life, it's Augusta. I just want to play the golf course. It's somewhere that you you're watching TV, you play on the PlayStation, um, so so to play in that event would just mean the world. Yeah, that's interesting. But um, another thing going forward, as you say, you seem to take it, you don't set specific goals, but you just seem to be taking, and again, I know it's a cliche, every tournament as it comes, every every week as it comes, do you, have you set goals beyond, um, I don't know, beyond 12 months? Getting in the majors is the main thing. I've not. I set goals at the start of the season. Um, that my whole my whole team know what I'm wanting to achieve, and we kind of knocked them out of the park early on. So we had to reset, and we're still chasing some of them goals. But if they don't happen, then hopefully they'll happen next year early on. Do you go back home to? I presume. Do you still live in Oban? Is that yeah. is that practical for when you're touring the world? Do you just go home for spells of weeks at a time? I do. That's that's kind of my release. I go home. Play shinty. Um, you, don't, you don't turn out for... Is it Oban Kabanacht? Kabanacht? Celtic now. Oban, Oban Celtic? Celtic. How did that, when did that happen? I've lost track of the shinty scene. But do um, you still play shinty? I do, yeah. Okay, is this your... And your dad was a good player as well. Aye. It's something that after, after Morocco, um, I wasn't enjoying golf. I wasn't enjoying travelling. So I had to find something outside of golf. And that's where I said to my dad I hadn't... I hadn't touched a shinty stick in about five years. So I said, my dad started taking a team. I goes, I'm going to come back and do a bit of training. Done the training. I got a bug for it again and started play, played a few games. And my season kind of turned a, a corner to go the right way. And it seems to be working. Hmm. I, well, it does seem to be working. Listen, very <laughs> best of luck this week. It's going to be a, it could be a quite a tight race, though, because uh, you, Kirk Kadayama, uh, you uh, Victor Perez, you're all very, very close together. So are you just focusing on doing your own thing and hoping that it takes care of itself in the rookie department? Yeah, I'm playing with Kurt in the first round, so I'll be able to see how his game's looking. Um, but I can only, I can only control my game, and if I do that, then I'm, I'm pretty confident I'll walk away with. It. Mm. My advice to you would be start to talk to Kurt about Shinty on the first hole and see if he can just mess with his head a little bit. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you to our latest guest, Bob McIntyre. Thank you. thank you, Bob. Bob. Bobby, as we know him now. So he is leading the race to become European Tour Rookie of the Season. So our final guest on this live podcast on Life on Tour, presented by Hilton, here at the Waldorf Astoria on the Palm, is the man who is out in front of them all at the moment. He's hoping to win the race to Dubai. Please welcome from Austria, Bernd Wiesberger. <laughs> Bernd, how are you? Welcome, welcome, and oh, my cushion's fallen down. Right, how are you? Yeah, very good, very good, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, I'm perfect. doing okay. Um, so, Bernd, I mean, you're obviously in a great position at the moment, but a little bit like the, the rookie of the, the season race, you know, it's still open for business. You've got Tommy Fleetwood up there, um, uh, uh, John Ram is there, Matt Fitzpatrick. I mean, there are a few who can still catch you. So how are you feeling going into this final week? 
Yeah, I'm uh, really looking forward to this. Um, had a good week last week in uh, in South Africa, a couple uh, of days off and, and a bit um, relaxing uh, here in Dubai. And uh, it was an odd day today, obviously, with the weather, but uh, feeling good. Looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, probably, um, yeah, looking forward as much as I've ever looked forward to, to any round of golf. So it's going to be going to be fun out there. Going to uh, appreciate the chance I have this week and um, trying to do the best, yeah. Have you heard of the sport of shinty? No, my next question is, so coming into this season, has this season surprised you? Because you've been coming back from problems, injury problems, you know, three wins. Could you ever have imagined that this season would have been quite so successful? Um, tough to say, you know, uh, we have had changes with the, with the system. We, uh, we lay out our, our race to Dubai with the point system, so uh, a little bit fairer throughout the board to, to get, uh, if, you, if you do well and win tournaments, you, you uh, you get a bit quicker up the ranking, so that definitely helped me to be in that position as well. But no, um, I had a rough start to the year, coming off an injury last year, and um, you know when I was in position, I played really good, so I really uh, um, was able to to make up ground there. And uh, it was a bit surprising because you never know what's going to happen after after a year off with seven months. So uh, being back in the position, playing for tournaments against these guys, I played against. Uh, uh, Bob in, in Denmark on the first first win I've had this year and it was a was a great Sunday obviously um, even better for me but uh, really enjoyed those moments and uh, you know kept pushing and and um, fortunate enough I, I got into a position where we can uh, play for the race to do a title now but I know it was through injury that you were outside the world's top hundred as a result of that injury so when, you, when you're coming back from injury you know you can do it and you've done it before but you must still have a few doubts that will I be able to get back to the top yeah, um, it was a weird, weird time. Um, I've never, knock on wood, I've never been injured before, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll stay lucky and, and won't, I won't get injured again. But uh, um, you know, as a professional, you keep doing your thing for so many years, the same, same all over, and you get um, kind of ripped out of that uh, process. It's, it's a kind of a, a weird, uh, weird scenario, and I had to adapt to that. And, and also coming back, you know, um, you. Uh, you keep, keep going in this uh, kind of same scenario for, for so many years, playing the tournaments, and then it's gone, and then you have to go back into it. And it felt uh, quite weird when I first had a scorecard in my hand again. So I uh, um, had, to, had to learn to play golf, competitive golf again for over the first couple of tournaments. But uh, once we got back in the groove, it was, uh, it was good, yeah. It's a pretty good times for Austrian golf because Matthias Schwab is going, uh, is going very, very well indeed. How, how is golf perceived? in Austria, is it a popular sport? Yeah, we're doing, we're doing well, you know, Matthias had a great rookie year last year uh, and even better one this, you know, um, just very recently, almost uh, won in Turkey and it was in a, a six-man playoff and a uh, great event in, uh, in, uh, in China where I finished fourth, so um, we're trying to entertain uh, the Austrian golf fans and, um, you know, raise the awareness of, of our sport. Um, yeah, but, but to be honest, uh, we're, we're skiing and, and, and football nation uh, mainly. And, uh, but I think with, with success of, of, um, of, of local talent in, in each country, it gets more popular. And we're trying to do uh, the best to, to, you know, to keep doing that and, uh, and, and get, get younger people involved and get more people into the sport. Are you a skier? I mean, it feels a bit of a cliche to say to an Austrian, are you a skier? But Because uh, you're from Vienna, which is a little bit the flatter part of the country. But are you a good yeah. skier? Yeah, um, well, I'm yes, I'm I'm awesome. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't start racing, um, uh, do, do some ski, uh, race uh, skiing, but uh, I'm good enough not to fall down. I think uh, any Austrian is uh, educated in, in, in the art of skiing or, or snowboarding enough to, uh, to get down the slope safely. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward actually to go for a couple of days before Christmas. So we've had a, a lot of snow in the time I was away, so uh, for me it's a great getaway from uh, from golf uh, in the winter and enjoy uh, some, some nice time on the slopes. But a lot of sportsmen won't do sports like that for risk of, again, knock on wood, risk of, yeah. of injury, but I suppose you can't not live your life. You know, you want to still enjoy your, your yeah. life as well. Uh, it has to be good. I'm, I'm not going to go stupid. I've, I've broken my collarbone skiing uh, when I was um, 18. And I think I've learned my lesson there. So uh, doesn't sound like you're actually that good a skier to me, about. Well, it, it was an, another part involved who was maybe not doing uh, the right thing either. But you know, 
I was going a bit too quick and somebody was not in the right place at the, where they should have been, so things came together. Yeah, you learn from that stuff. Uh, not going as quick anymore, um, trying to be aware where everybody is around me so nobody crashes into me. And uh, But as you said, I think uh, you got to balance it. you got to live your life as well a little bit, do the things you enjoy doing. Um, uh, but, you know, because we need to be healthy in, in, our, in our game and uh, in our sport, you want to be um, aware of... Uh, or, or make sure you don't injure yourself. So, um, yeah. But, uh, but as I said, uh, I, I enjoy my times on the slope when I can. You got any questions out there? I'm going to take live questions. If anyone's got questions. The man drinking beer. You've got to uh, ask a question to earn that beer. Honestly, now you're, now you're ashamed of that beer, which is non-alcoholic, I can see. Actually, I've got a question from Jessamy for Bernd Wiesberger from Jessamy. It's a good name, Jessamy. Um, who was your inspiration growing up? Well, I mean, I think... The only Austrian golfer, I think, Marcus uh, yeah. Breer was a, was a very good golfer. But um, was he in particular sort of someone you looked up to, or were you a fan of any other golfers in particular? Well, um, I grew up in the 1997 generation watching Tiger win the Masters uh, in the black and red. Um, so obviously that is very inspiring to a young golfer. Um, actually, one of my personal... Um, Heroes, uh, Ernie Els, I've, I've had the pleasure to play with a lot of golf with. I really enjoyed uh, watching him when I when I grew up. Um, and you know, Marcus, I mean, for for Austrian golf, um, I think he inspired a lot of the the younger professionals who are um, out there now in Austria. And certainly, I'm trying to inspire some some of the younger players as well. So, so Marcus coming out here, winning on the European Tour, that kind of opened a whole new. Uh, um, perception of, of what he can achieve, um, even, like even as an Austrian golfer, you wouldn't think that would, that would be possible for for uh, for us from a mainly winter sport um, country. Yeah. What about this here? In terms of your wins, have been a couple, a couple of them very big wins as well in the Rolex Series events. You seem to save your good golf for some of the biggest events. So that stands you in good stead for this week. Yeah, I've played the Rolex Series events really well this year. Uh, I've had a couple of wins. Uh, runner-up in, in the third last week, so that definitely helped. Um, I, I was really um, looking forward to these events. Uh, obviously, we're trying to um, prepare as, as good as possible for, for any week, but especially for, for those big events, and uh, we've done really well with that. So, um, yeah, and um, that's, that was definitely key for me, for me sitting now here uh, in, you know, in the leading position. Now, I said you save your goal for some of the biggest events, but in the majors, do you think, as somebody with seven wins on tour, do you think that perhaps the majors have been a little bit of a letdown for you? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's kind of uh, uh, bumps me a little bit that I haven't been able to, to play better golf in those events. So, uh, fortunately, after last year, where you know, we said dropped out of the, the World Top three, uh, 300 and now coming back and being able to play uh, those events again, um, it's definitely a... a a bigger um, desire to, to play better in these events and, uh, and prepare uh, accordingly. And um, so that's, that's going to be exciting for, for next year. Now, I saw you at Le Golf National during the Ryder Cup commentating. So you were doing t a TV commentary, was it? for? Y yeah. Um, you know, I, I tried to stay some of the way, but somewhat close to the game. So I had the opportunity with, with, with Sky and Sky Germany to, to be on site. Uh, obviously, I've had uh, some success at, at Golf National winning there in 2015. So I... I kind of knew what I was talking about when we were about, about the golf course, so they asked me if I wanted to to join the team on site for for Sky Germany. And uh, yeah, is it, was it difficult good. though in a way as well because you want to be close to the event, but you so badly want to be playing as well that sometimes it can be quite hard to to be watching and talking about it. Yeah, at this point, I mean, I was uh, actually in the process of, of I've had my injury, uh, I had my surgery done. I I was in the process of coming back to to practicing and, and getting back into the the rhythm of a golf professional, so uh, it was very inspiring to see the guys uh, go out there and, and, and win the cup back for Europe uh, at a golf course that's very close to my heart, so it was, um, it was good to see a lot of good friends uh, out there who, who, who did well and uh, definitely uh, you know, fueled, fueled the fire even more to, um, to come out in 2019 and, and, and uh, you know, push forward uh, from, from what have been uh, a quite hard one and a half year, uh, one and a half years, not only with injury but also I didn't play particularly well before that. So um, I'm quite glad about how the how things turned around for me. Where would that rank for you making a Ryder Cup team? And we talk about Austrian golf, and you know to, to have an Austrian playing uh, in, in the Ryder Cup that would only help 
give the game more exposure in your country as well. Yeah, we did, a, I think, a, a really good bid for, um, for 2022. Uh, uh, Austria was really, really much up there and, and, and uh, willing to, to host the Ryder Cup as well. Obviously, we're going uh, to Italy, but the awareness of, of you know, how, how important that Ryder Cup is for, for uh, the golfing world, um, uh, you know, that, that arrived in, in Austria and, and it would, would even more so if uh, we would get uh, a couple of guys on that team and, um, you know, would love to be part of that team. Uh, we've just been uh, fortunate enough to get uh, uh, our hands on some of the Ryder Cup um, uh, clothing get get um, the, the the measurements taken, so that's 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 really cool, and it gets you uh, really a spark to to be part of that. Okay, how many? Who are the select few? How many get measured up for potential Ryder Cup clothing? Um, I don't, I don't know the exact number. I mean, there's uh, there's 50 guys here this week. Um, a, a couple that won't be eligible due to the nationality, but. I don't know. I've seen I've seen Rafa there. I've seen Till Hatton there. Uh, Frankie. I've seen uh, obviously uh, all all the guys who've played in the last couple of teams. I'd, I'd say a good um, 30, 40 guys. I'm sure have um, uh, have walked in there and uh, and take measurements. So um, yeah, it's it's a lot of talent out here on the European tour uh, and only a few spots. So uh, uh, you better wanna you better play well to get on it. I imagine if you're one of those who doesn't get measured for it. Oh. Outside. They didn't call you? Looking in. They haven't <laughs> called me yet. They just know uh, double XL, uh, chest expanded. Um, yeah. Anyway, so what about the Olympics next year as well then? Because again, we've been talking about that. It is a big thing on the horizon. And again, you know, talk, playing for Europe is one thing, but playing for your own country is, is the unique chance that you have now in golf. Yeah, uh, I've been there in Rio uh, at uh, the first Olympics after... Uh, this is terrible, I should have noticed that. You played great golf. How did you get on in Rio? I was, <laughs> I was doing other sports at the time. So. Yeah. I, I did okay. I finished uh, 11th. I had 11th, a I was about a, a to say it was 11th or thereabouts. Uh, a, a shocking first day, but I um, wasn't able to catch up to the, to the medal rankings. But um, a completely different experience, you know. Uh, I, I, I tried to do the whole lot. I tried to be at the, at the opening ceremony, walk in with, with your, uh, your countrymen and uh, experience that into Maracanã Stadium, which is, uh, was amazing. Who was uh, the flag bearer for Austria? Who was the flag bearer? Oh, come uh, on, you weren't paying attention uh, either. No, I was just. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a good, good question. I don't, I don't remember. This, this will be lost in the edit. Yeah. Don't worry about uh, it. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up. It's terrible. I should have known that. But anyways, uh, stayed in the Olympic Village. Um, uh, first day, I got to remember um, we were we were just on the balcony and then uh, seeing Novak Djokovic on the on the courts down there practicing and uh, and walking down there and you, you close and see all those. Um, superstars of sport, uh, Olympic champions there uh, was was amazing. So um, yeah, uh, it, it's going to be just just as uh, just as great in uh, in, in Japan next uh, next year. So um, I've always been um, trying to to represent uh, the Austrian flag as much as I can on a, on a, a national team level, um, but also you know on, on on teams at Eurasia Cup um, and in the Olympics then. So. Uh, um, it's always nice to, to play for a country. I think we've got somebody on it who's working on who was the flag bearer for Austria at the Rio Olympics. I yeah. did the opening ceremony and I can't remember, but a lot of things happened. Yeah. Anyway, so um, this let's talk about this week because we talked about a fierce competition. But again, what would it mean for you in your career to have won the race to Dubai? Uh, apart from the significant financial reward, it's a huge honour. Yeah, it is. Um, I had the chance to stand next to a trophy today and some um, some stuff for for TV. And if you look look on some of the guys who've, who've won that, obviously uh, in in uh, recent history with with Colin Montgomery winning seven times in a row and uh, um, a lot of history on that um, uh, on that trophy. So having the chance to get your name engraved on that would be would be amazing. And uh, um, you don't know how many opportunities you get for that. So we we go out there and give give everything we have this week and, and make sure we. We have a, have a chance to do that. Can you read that? I can read that. Oh, Liu Jia, who, yeah. Who was it? Hang on a second. Yeah, Liu Jia from... Liu Jia. She, she, she went... Uh, she was on the golf course every day to watch, yeah. Liu Jia, yeah. table tennis. Yeah. She was the flag bearer for Austria. Yeah. She played... I think she uh, she was in oof, five or, or six Olympic uh, Olympic games, yeah. She she um, she played loads, yeah. Okay. Chinese, Chinese heritage, but... Uh, 
I played for Austria many, many years in the Olympics. Oh, yeah. What are your long-term goals then in golf? Do you, or do you not set long-term goals? Because it's such a game that you just never know what's going to happen in terms of form or injury or whatever. Yeah. You just try and enjoy it. Yeah, you, d you don't know uh, what's, what's happening. You know, little things can, can cause a major uh, upset in that. But obviously, we're looking forward to having um, somewhat of a, of, a, uh, of a more normal schedule again for us, playing the, the major events and the WGCs and, and the big events here in Europe. And... Uh, you know, coming off of this season like we've, we've done this year, um, hopefully big things are ahead for us. And uh, yeah, it's uh, exciting times and um, uh, look, looking forward to, to each each challenge that is, that is out there. Well, good luck. Viel Glück, as they sometimes Thank say. Thank you. Thank uh, <laughs> you. As they say for this week, have we got any final questions at all for Bernd Biesberger? I say, I love you, audience. You've been great. But in terms of your questions, step up your game, all of you. Uh, Bernd Wiesgarger, um, we wish you all the very best. I think John's left the, the building already. So very best of luck in the Race to Dubai uh, Challenge this week. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. To Bernd Wiesberger. And thank you to all of our guests as well, to Brendan Lawler, to John Ram, to Bob, Bobby McIntyre as well. We can all repair to the bar now and join a Dougie McIntyre who I think is still there. So uh, thank you for coming along and enjoying the season finale of Life on Tour presented by Hilton here in the Waldorf Astoria on the Palm. Enjoy the sunshine for the rest of the week. I'm going to be in Leeds tomorrow, so uh, looking forward to that and have enjoyed the rain today in Dubai. But thank you for listening as well to the whole season. If you have been listening at home, you can catch up on Acast, on, uh, on iTunes podcast, uh, selection as well. Uh, lots of good interviews are there, but I hope you've enjoyed listening to our golfers talking this evening here in Dubai. Uh, thank you very much and good evening. Bye bye. To watch another European Tour video, click here, and to subscribe, click here.